Hey, Jesus, sorry I'm late. Work was crazy today. No, don't get up. It's okay. Uh, yeah, just got a little bit behind. People are being crazy, you know. That's no problem, Chuck. I'm just glad. Uh, I'm glad I made it, too. Listen, let's get down to business. I have a lot of work here. A lot of requests. First things first, pastor and his wife are at a conference. Keep them safe. Um, but, uh, not a fan of the assistant pastor. The less he preaches, the better. Uh, what else? Ralph, his wife, is getting a tattoo removed. It's a stupid college party way back when. You know how those things go. It's in a real painful spot. I'm not a fan of football here, but my friend is. And if I could have two tickets to take him to show him how cool I am so he'd be my friend some more, that'd be great. My dog nibbles. As a gimp leg. Chimney crickets. You know, now that I'm thinking, I could use a new jacket. I'm getting fuzzies all in this one. Please bless my sister, my mother, my father. Our father who art in heaven. My neighbor, Cindy. Hallowed be thy name. Can you sort of train my church to clap on two and four, please? One and three, this is not disco, people. This is serving the Lord. The guy who brings in my shopping cart from the thing. Something I can do to get a raise. Can you read what I wrote here? I think I was, I was dreaming. Plus the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Agriculture, the Secretary of Secretaries. Bless their secretaries. Thy kingdom, thy kingdom come. And that's what bothers me about my mother. Hey, look at the time there. That's, uh, it's, uh, gotta get going there. Jesus is gonna wrap this up and say amen. Amen. Uh, it's been a pleasure praying with you. It's fine evening. I'll be talking with you. Have a good day. Did you catch what the message of this video was? Or do you need to play it again? <laughs> I, I chuckled because several times, uh, wow, that's, that's something else. But it reminds me of a passage I referred to recently in a message, a passage from the Old Testament in the book of Malachi. It's actually the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi was giving a stern warning to the people of Israel that they were treating God in such a horrible way. What they were doing, when it would come time for service times, in those days they did the sacrifices until Jesus, Lamb of God, for once and for all, took care of all sacrifices. Blessed Lamb of God. Before then, there was a sacrificial system. But it was very clear in the Word of God that when they came to offer their sacrifices, they were to give the first fruits, the very best. It's the basis for all things in life. Instead of giving God leftovers, we're to give him first place in all areas, our time, our talent, our treasure, our, where he's in first place. They were coming to the time of sacrifice and saying, boy, we got all these animals here. <sighs> boy. But, you know, hey, See that lame one there, that diseased one? What does he have, a bull or something? Uh, why don't you just um, offer that one? Oh. oh, here's another one. You can offer this one to God. Then they go into their pantry, instead of bringing out the fresh showbread, which was by the, by the, the law of Moses, prepared special for this offering of bread, they would get the old stale stuff green with mold, and they would bring it along with the sick, diseased meat of the animals, and they would say, oh God, how we love you, creator God, we brought you this sacrifice of our, of our love. <clears throat> Amen. Malachi said, try offering to your governor your human governor, what you're offering God and see if your religion makes sense. Well, I would apply that. How about our prayer? As we said that day, why don't we give it the spouse test? Treat our spouse like we treat God and ask, have to ask how long our marriage would last. The way we pray so many times is just so short, just so 
So we don't really want to hear what he has to say because we're too in a hurry. I think that much of the praying that goes on within the body of Christ, specifically in America, and there are many other places in the world too that I would put in the same classification, but especially in America, since that's where we are, could be accurately illustrated by that little video clip. That's about the extent of our praying. Just giving God our opinion or our requests, but not there to hear his voice, what the Spirit has to say to the church. And you might say, are you judging, Pastor? No. Simply examining fruit. And that's biblical. The Bible encourages us to be fruit examiners. By your fruits, ye shall know them. If the Church of Jesus Christ was using its power of attorney effectively, we would be seeing the evidence everywhere. And what is very painfully clear is the lack of evidence of a mighty move of God. You just see a few hot spots here and there, but it's scary almost for you that know what our country was like years ago across, across this nation. Alive churches, whether they were tiny, small, medium-sized, huge, all had, had this passion for the Lord. But I, boy, it's just harder and harder to find nowadays. Today we're so busy, there's so much noise that I think many times as that video portrayed, every time Jesus would go, the person portraying Jesus would go to say something, he would just hurry on. And very effective, I think. And today we tend to run and do and go, even including Sunday morning, almost like a checklist, check, 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 did that, did that, did that, did that. Running through life, pale mail. This poem that is one of my favorites. We mutter and sputter, we fume and we spurt, we mumble and grumble, our feelings get hurt. We can't understand things, our vision grows dim when all that we need is a moment with Him. So that's what's so refreshing on Mondays. We come here without an agenda. Monday evenings, prayer meeting. How long has this been going on? Almost two years now, I think, for the most part, for, with a brief break there for our sabbatical. But it's, it's phenomenal. Because we don't come with a, with a lesson or sermon or, or things to share as far as day to day and stuff like that. We really get right to praying pretty quick. And it's refreshing. It sure refreshes my soul, and I know it does to each one that participates. Now, question. If you were absolutely certain that God would answer a prayer of yours exactly in the way that you desired it to be answered, what would you pray for? Let me repeat it. Paraphrase. If you were absolutely certain that God would answer your prayer, what would you pray for? That's an interesting one, wisdom. You know, that's what Solomon, I, I put that in there and then I took it out. Solomon, God came to Solomon and says, what do you want? He was so pleased with Solomon's efforts at the temple, building the temple. He was so pleased and finally he said, Solomon, what do you want? And what did Solomon ask for? Wisdom. Yeah, interesting. Let me ask you this. If you are absolutely certain that God would answer your prayer, would it change the way you approach prayer? Do 
Jesus said, as we've been looking in John 14, 13 to 14, you can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it, so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Of course, we've been talking about what's all implied there. And we'll touch that a little bit later as we go into an illustration found in James. As I said earlier in the service, last Monday evening during our intercessory prayer time, I read the following passage from James, chapter 5, beginning with verse 13. Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Wow. Wow. As we sang earlier in the service, it's heart of worship. It's all about you. It's not about me, it's all about you. Well, I could say the heart of healing. It's not about the oil, it's about the obedience. Then he goes on to say, in verse 16, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer, ooh, that could be a sermon in itself. The earnest prayer of a righteous person. There's another sermon. The earnest prayer of a righteous person, by definition, you've already met all the qualifications for answered prayer. A righteous person won't be looking for selfish motivations. A righteous person will be seeking the kingdom of God. His will, by definition, or they're not a righteous person. Do you understand? So the righteous person, praying fervently, what does that imply? Faith believing. Praying fervently in faith believing. Now, the motivations of the heart are taken care of with the clause, or the qualifier, or the adjective, righteous person. So let's finish this up. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Now we go to our parable today, found in the Old Testament. Elijah was as human as we are, and yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. Now even though this story that James refers to happened, took place hundreds of years before the incarnation of Christ, it is a valid way of learning what God can accomplish if we will use our power of attorney. Now, for you that weren't, haven't been accompanying the last two or three messages, speaking of the power of attorney, that's using Jesus' name. If you ask anything in my name. But just understand, that's as if Jesus were doing or requesting or wanting what you're asking for. Make sure it would be his will if you're going to use his name. Otherwise, it's using our Lord's name in vain. You understand what I'm saying? It's tacking on in the name of Jesus. It's sort of some kind of magic phrase that just will make it happen. No. When we use his power of attorney, when we say in Jesus' name, it's as if Jesus were there himself and that was his will for that the request to be fulfilled. 
I'm not going today to read the whole story of Elijah, but it's an awesome story. If you haven't read the story of Elijah, I would encourage you to go to 1 Kings and read chapters 17, 18, and 19. It's a great read for your children. Uh, wonderful. Teens, you should be reading this. It's just wonderful. So a lesson from Elijah today that I'm going to be touching on is how we see in his life and his praying that he was persistent. He was persistent. Dogged, persis dogged persistency, I could say. Well, I tried to say it, it didn't come out. <laughs> he was prayed specifically. Remember earlier in the service when I said I'd be going back to that point? We're almost there. He prayed according to God's will, or hello, nothing would have happened. <laughs> but we're going to read about. He prayed in faith believing. And he prayed with proper motivations. First of all, a little bit of the background. The king of Israel at that time was a man named Ahab. Ahab. His wife was a Philistine woman and was infamous for her wickedness. Her name? Jezebel. Jezebel. You know, I've met some girls named Jezebel. You think, did you read your Bible? Whoa! You know? Jezebel. Now, my dad named something Jezebel. But I think with... I think he really was right on this one. When I was a little kid and they were pastoring in Salem, Oregon. They started the South Salem Church. Began that church. And um, they had an old Nash... I think it's like a 47, if best I can recollect. 1947, this would have been like in 58. This is an old car. And dad nicknamed that car Jezebel. It was so temperamental. <laughs> Never knew when it was going to start. <laughs> yeah, Jezebel. And it was fatally flawed like Jezebel. I mean, Jezebel was always trying to kill people. Um, this Nash was always trying to kill people. <laughs> yeah, it had the suicide doors. One day, I went to try to close the door that wasn't quite closed. And if my adopted brother hadn't grabbed onto my pants, I'd have been out. Killed by Jezebel. Because the suicide door, once the wind catches it, just pulls it like a sail. <laughs> oh! Jezebel. <sighs> now, partly because of Jezebel's evil influence, Ahab and the nation of Israel had fallen into a kind of high-bred paganism. They still prayed to Yahweh. Are you hearing me? They still prayed to Yahweh. But... They also worshipped some really evil pagan gods. <gasps> Baal and Asherah. So because of their disobedience, God sent Elijah. Every time the nation of Israel would get far from God, he would raise up a prophet or someone that would stand in the gap between his wrath and the sin of the nation of Israel. So here comes Elijah. He's dropped in the, verse, in the first verse of chapter 17. We don't know where he came from except the area of the country he came from. Don't know anything about his upbringing or anything. All of a sudden, this man, out of nowhere, seemingly out of nowhere, shows up in Ahab's presence. And this is the decree he gives. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. First of all, part of, the, part of the decree that he was passing to Ahab was that it wouldn't rain or have dew for three and a half years. Now think of it, three and a half years. And one of the most amazing parts of that is no dew. That means there was, the relative humidity was zero. And you 
SoCal people know what I'm talking about when you say zero relative humidity. There wouldn't even be in the morning, at the cool of the morning or anything like that, any kind of dew. Wow, that's pretty harsh. Three and a half years without a drop of water. Wow. And now we pick up the story. You can imagine Elijah was the number one enemy on every single hit list. Rewards on his head. Bring me the head of Elijah. Hated. And we pick up in verse 21. Then Elijah stood in front of them and said, How much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions? As I said, they were supposedly praying to Yahweh and also serving the idols. How much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people were completely silent. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only prophet of the Lord who is left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Now bring two bulls. The prophets of Baal may choose which one they wish to cut it into pieces and lay it on the wood of their altar, but without setting fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood on the altar, but not set fire to it. Then call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by setting fire to the wood is the true God. And the people all agreed. Shame, shame, shame. They agreed to this little contest. They were really far from God. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, You go first, for there are many of you. Choose one of the bulls and prepare it and call on the name of your God, but do not set fire to the wood. So they prepared one of the bulls and placed it on the altar. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning until noontime, shouting, Oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no reply of any kind. Then they danced, hobbling around the altar they had made. About noontime, Elijah began mocking them. That's different, isn't it? We Christians are used to being mocked. He sort of switched the tables here. Uh, it's sort of like, uh, yeah, the other day we were talking about Paul actually prayed for someone to go blind. That's sort of different. This is, boy, Elijah. About noontime, Elijah began mocking them. You'll have to shout louder, he scoffed. For surely he's a god. Perhaps he's daydreaming or is relieving himself. Or maybe he's away on a trip or is asleep. He needs to be awakened. Wake him up. You better yell louder. Louder. So they shouted louder. And following their normal custom, they cut themselves with knives and swords until blood gushed out. They raved all afternoon until the time of the evening sacrifice. But still there was no sound, no reply, no response. Now understand, dear ones, this went on for hours and hours and hours. Look at the contrast when he prays. <laughs> the ferv fervent, effective prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Then Elijah called to the people, come over here. They all crowded around him as he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. You got to start with repentance, dear ones. If you're going to have God answer prayer, it has to start with repentance. Nowhere in the history of mankind has there been a powerful move of God without it being without the prelude being bona fide, genuine, heartfelt repentance. <laughs> Just that's the way it is. That's the way it'll always be until he takes us home. So he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. He took 12 stones, one to represent each of the tribes of Israel. And he used the stones to rebuild the altar in the name of the Lord. Then he dug a trench around the altar large enough to hold about three gallons. He piled wood on the altar, cut the bull into pieces, and laid the pieces on the wood. Then he said, fill four large jars with water. Now what was scarce? Water. 
Can you imagine the anger at seeing what this man's about to do? Talk about in your face faith. Okay. Fill four large jars with water and pour water over the offering and the wood. And they had done that. After they had done this, he said, do the same thing again. And when they were finished, he said, now do it a third time. It's funny how God over and over again brings symbolism in three days in the tomb. Over and over again. The Old Testament helps us understand the New Testament. Here we go. Do it again. The water ran around the altar and even filled the trench. Now, I love this part of the story. At the usual time for offering the evening sacrifice. There is something about routine, dear ones. It's good to come to church on Sunday mornings. That type of a routine is healthy. It's good. It's biblical. Paul says, don't abandon getting together. This is very important. Wednesday night, like I say, we, we have a tremendous crowd on Wednesday nights that comes. It's, 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 it's a blessing. Thank you so much for you that make it happen. You that prepare the food every, every week. Thank you. So important. Jeep, welcome back. And see you in the kitchen. <laughs> wow. She's phenomenal. At the usual time for offering, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed. I think he said it in a loud voice just to be heard, but not because he had to for God's sake. <laughs> a prayer from the heart is worth ever as much as from the lips, and much more if the lips aren't reflecting the heart. Here it goes. Listen to what happened just before then. Hundreds cutting themselves, screaming. O oh Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. O oh Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God, and that you have brought them back to yourself. We could say today, in Jesus' name, amen. Immediately. What's the word? What's the word? Immediately. The fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood. What's next? The stones? How do stones burn? Stones don't burn. Dear ones, let me just open a pair for, I mean, a parenthesis here. I wasn't planning on it, but just, there are, there's so many hearts that are hardened like stone today in our world against God. But the sexual fervent prayer of a righteous person availeth much. You can, like we said last week, you can unleash God through intercessory prayer to work where without your praying, he would be limited by his own law of free will. Wow! Bring down strongholds in Jesus' name. Take authority. You know it's his will because it's written. He came to set the captives free. This fire was so hot it burned up the stones and the dust. In other words, God gave an exclamation point. 
besides answering by fire. <laughs> you know what, there really be any doubt that it was sort of trickery on Elijah's part. Uh-uh. When all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and cried, The Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord is God. So all this that I've just read precedes that prayer that James says should be the person that should be our example in praying, Elijah. But he says, we already touched on the part, didn't read it in the scriptures itself, but that he said there will be no rain. No rain or dew. Three and a half years later, we just read what happened. Then in verse 41, then Elijah said to Ahab, Go get something to eat and drink, for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. Dear ones, catch this. When we go through this, catch what just happened. Elijah hears a great rainstorm coming. Where? So Ahab went to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top top of Mount Carmel, bowed low to the ground, and prayed with his face between his knees. Oh, I'm glad that's not the position you've got to assume for <laughs> prayers to be answered, or it would never happen on this servant. Some of you will get that later. Then he said to his servant, go and look out toward the sea. The servant went and looked. Then returned to Elijah and said, I didn't see anything. Seven times, seven times, Elijah told him to go and look. And finally, the seventh time, his servant told him, I <laughs> didn't even make the Doppler radar. I mean, this is <laughs> a tiny worth mentioning, <laughs> really. <sighs> There's nothing out there. But I <laughs> no, wouldn't say nothing. I think, uh, I think there's a chemtrail, just a little bit of a chemtrail, you know, just a little puff of smoke up there. <sighs> but it's about the size of man's hand. <laughs> oh. I saw a little cloud about the size of man's hand rising from the sea. Then Elijah shouted, Hurry to Ahab and tell him, Climb into your chariot and go back home. If you don't hurry, the rain will stop you. You'll get stuck in the mud. Wow. And soon, what was spoken in prophecy, seven times of praying earlier, I hear, I hear the storm are coming. Soon the sky was black with clouds, a heavy wind brought a terrific rainstorm, and Ahab left quickly for Jezreel. Then the Lord gave special strength to Elijah. This is a miracle we don't hear about very often. He tucked his cloak into his belt and ran ahead of the king's chariot all the way to the entrance of Jezreel. <laughs> That's another sermon. Now, living in so-called, I can really... So cow, sorry. Living in so cow, I can, I know what happened here. Three and a half years with no dew. Do you know what the fire hazard was? You do, don't you? <laughs> we live it here. If the Lord hadn't sent that rain, the, everything would have been destroyed by fire. <laughs> when you melt rock, you think you're going to have a fire? I bet the flames are already scaring everybody to death. Oh, wow. Why'd you go pray for fire? We're in trouble. We're under a firework for three and a half years. We're in trouble. We're a tinderbox. Better send the rain. <laughs> wow. Prayer that calms the storm in Jesus' name. Prayer that causes a storm in Jesus' name. And now I'm going to finish with the five points very quickly. Persistent praying. Did you catch it? Kept praying until the answer came. Kept praying. Have you given up on the, in the ninth inning? Have you been watching the games? Don't give up. Don't give up. I did. 
I didn't want to see it. I turned it off and found out. <laughs> turned it off too early. A lot of people give up praying. Just too tiring. Don't give up. On the brink of a miracle. Amen? Amen. I think that discomfort that Elijah prayed in, putting his head between his knees, was to keep him focused on praying and not be distracted by anything else. Probably a raging fire in the area. Because there's no water to put it out, dear ones. Praying and fasting, to me, that's what it's a lot about. Fasting. Why do we pray and fast? The Pharisees prayed and fast, and they weren't anything of God. The fasting helps us Christians when we pray and fast to keep focused on prayer. Every time a hunger pang hits, ooh, ooh, I remember why I'm hungry. Oh, Lord. Okay. Specific praying. Specific praying. He didn't simply ask God to bless Israel. He asked God for rain. Specific prayer request. Specific answer. Dear ones, I've used this illustration. You know what I'm talking about when I say when you have an elephant charging you, you can take a shotgun shell with bird pellet in it and shoot at the elephant charging you and it will just get more angry. But if you take the same amount of lead that that bird shot is, form it into the shape of a bullet, fired out of a rifle, you can down an elephant. A lot of praying we do is just so generalized, we wouldn't even know if God answered it. Be specific. He had a specific prayer request. Send rain. Send fire. Send rain. Stop rain. Specific prayer request. Specific answers. That's why, Jackie, I said what I said. Thank you. We can pray more specifically about T cells and B cells. I think. Okay. Use our power of attorney. Praying according to God's will, like I say, Elijah could have prayed till he was blue in the face. It wouldn't have happened unless it was God's will. But God had already told him ahead of time. Did you catch that in the passage? God told him to go say, it won't rain. God told him to go say, you better go because it's going to rain. Okay. Number four. Praying in faith. Phenomenal. Elijah prayed in faith believing. How do we know that? Go back a few verses where it said, I hear a mighty storm a coming. There it is, the faith. Uh, in, the, in the western town that experienced hard drought, a church called a service together to pray for rain. And it packed the church and then the pastor sent everyone home before it even prayed anything. And they said, we well, came to pray for rain. He says, no faith here. No one brought umbrellas. <laughs> well, you're really praying with faith. <laughs> I probably wouldn't have either, so. Or. Praying with faith. Praying with proper motivations, dear ones. Elijah prayed with the hope that the prayer would be a witness. Listen to 1 Kings 18, 16. I mean, 36. 1 Kings 18, 36. At the usual time for offering the evening, evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed, O oh Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all, that, all this at your command. O oh Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. Praying with proper motivations. It wasn't about Elijah. It was about God. Let's all stand. Father, we as children of the King of Kings live far below our privileges as princes as children of the most high God we don't use our power of attorney effectively 
Maybe it's because of walking behind light. Maybe we're harboring sin in our lives. Maybe it's because of a lack of faith. Maybe it's a lack of dedication of earnestly seeking you and seeking your face day and night. And no matter what we're doing to support our, our families and stuff, always in an attitude of prayer, constantly in prayer, uh, whatever it is, we are not effectively using our power of attorney as your children. The name of Jesus. Ask anything in my name. According to the will of the Father, it will be done. Well, help us to use the power of attorney more effectively tomorrow than we did today. Help us to start maybe with baby steps of praying and faith believing using our power of attorney and seeing you answer prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I heard someone speaking on that case and they had never prayed for anything in the name of Jesus. They were being encouraged to do so. And they said, well, well, how can I see that this works? She says, well, pick out something. And she said, the person said, well, hey, how about this? I have chapped lips. Can I pray using the name of Jesus for my chapped lips? Sure, but don't. Don't start off already with both lips. Just choose one. Choose one of the lips. So she did, and the lip she prayed for got well. How many of you know she had faith to believe for the next one? <laughs> we want to we wanna raise the dead. We don't pray many times for all the time, and all of a sudden something major happens in our lives, and all of a sudden, oh, Lord, why not trust him for small steps? And as you see God answer prayer, it builds your faith. It helps you to go on to the next level. To one day say, I hear a storm. I hear a storm. Better get, get, get going. In Jesus' name, have a wonderful day in his presence. If you can stop over for the baptismal, we'll be starting that in about 10 minutes.